Welcome Home, where we provide information, inspiration, and motivator after motivator after motivator. We have Loretta Tayar with us today. How are you doing, Loretta? I'm well, thank you, Cedric. How are you? I'm doing quite well. I'm doing quite well. Uh, you seem to be talking to me from your kitchen. Uh, where are you from? I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Okay. Well, and, and were you always in Brooklyn? Yes, I grew up in Brooklyn. I lived, um, my parents have owned their house in Bay Ridge forever. They got it when I was three months old. And as you can see, I'm super old. So that's a long time. And, um, and um, you know, I moved out on my own. I moved to another section of Brooklyn. But then um, I wound up coming back to my parents' house to take care of my mother who had who has Alzheimer's disease. So I have, um, we used to spend summers in New Jersey, but mm -hmm. for the most part I've lived here, you know, pretty much the bulk of my life. And, and what, was, what was life like for you growing up in Brooklyn? Talk about a, a regular childhood day in Brooklyn. Well, paint that picture for those of us who may have never been to Brooklyn before. Okay, so Brooklyn is an extremely diverse place but not where I grew up. I grew up in a very, um, um, in the seventies, it started to get a little bit more diverse. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm half Syrian, half German. So the Syrian side of me, the Arabic side was like, you know, no, not many people had seen too many Arabs in, in Brooklyn in the 1960s and seventies and even into the eighties. Um, wow. So it got, um, so it was, it's, what well, did it very diverse, but yeah. now, it wasn't too diverse, but now it's much more diverse. Okay. Did, did you see, did you see any, or did you notice any, any sort of um, tension because you all were new to the community or, or was it just a regular everyday, a regular everyday thing? No, no, it was fine. You know, we are, we, <laughs> you don't, you don't know me for years and years and years, but you know, I'm, you know, socially awkward and a little bit, uh, a little bit rigid. But um, but for the most part, we had a lot of friends. There was a lot of kids growing up. We did an awful lot of stuff, and we always had a good time. You know, growing up in Brooklyn is a lot different nowadays. You know, here we would get up in the morning, have our breakfast. You know, if we went to school, we all walked to school together. Everybody on the block had you know, multiple children, all the children walked together, all the children played after school together. They played, you know, they had to come in and do whatever their family rule was. So say, for instance, the family rule was you come home like ours. We had to come home, have our snack, do our homework, and then we can go out and play. Mm -hmm. So, and change our clothes because we had, you know, I was, I had my earlier education was in, um, was in private Catholic school. And okay. then when I went to high school, I went to the public high school. Okay. And so, and so what was, so it seems like you were having a pretty fun childhood. There were things to do all over the place. All over the place. We had boundaries, you know, like when we were little, we would, you know, if you know Brooklyn, you know that there's a lot of street lamps and there's um, parking signs all over the place for alternate right. sided street parking and all these parking rules. So we would have boundaries. Like we would say, okay, you know, um, you can go from this pole to this pole if we were little kids. Mm -hmm. When we got to be older kids, then we could go within a block radius, you know. And then as we got older, we can maybe do three or four blocks or we can call up and say, you know, if we came in and said to our parents, oh, we're all going to the park to um, play, then we could go to the park and then come back. So right. there was a lot more freedom and everybody was always playing out in the street. There would be some parent watching, you know, everybody was more, um, everything more was really more community in that way because all right. the kids were outside playing. So somebody would be on the stoop watching. If you want to cross the street and your parent, you know, somebody was there, so they would help you cross the street if you were little, you know, mm -hmm. there was always, because the mother stayed at home back then, you know, this is how old I am. Uh, my mother went back to work when I was in um, seventh grade. So what was I like 12? So, you know, they, you know, people were home. And if their parents weren't home, they just left you a note that said, go to Mrs. Clifford's house or go to Mrs. Massey's house. I'll be home in a little while, you know. Yeah. So, so it was, it was a little bit of a different time than what we have today where, 
you you got cars flying up and down the street. Everybody's uh, double parked, sometimes even triple parked. And well, we had all that because I I'm not so old that it was horse and buggy. But um, <laughs> no, but um, they were used to it. You know, people were used to the fact that they had to slow down and they had to stop. If we were playing stickball in the street and somebody was up to bat, then the car just had to wait for a minute until the play was made. Now right. who knows if anybody would be willing to make that sacrifice. Right. Or even or even, you know, sometimes people might think, why are these kids in the street? Instead of having a sense of understanding that, hey, this kids live here, they play outside, and me driving through is just that. I'm just driving through. But these kids live here. Do now exactly. do you, do you yep. see do you see that level of a of a of a difference in our communities today? Huge difference. So we never had um we never had play dates. Like I don't know how parents live their lives with the amount of play dates they have to show for their kids too. And we went everywhere by foot, you know, and then we, but we mostly played with everybody on the block. So everybody had kids. We were all out in the street. We had a back alleyway between our house. So the little ones would play in the alleyway and, you know, the bigger ones would play outside in the street. Oh, but there was always, we would always go to this one or that one's house, whoever was around, mm -hmm. you know, like if you were around during lunchtime, then the mother fed you a tuna sandwich when she fed her kids a tuna sandwich. Right. You know, it wasn't that, um, that insular thing, you know what I mean? Right, like everybody yeah. was always at somebody's house or they were like, my mother always wanted to watch her children. She had five kids. She always wanted to watch them. So she would invite everybody's kids over to her house because she wanted that level of supervision, mm -hmm. you know? Right. So we always had a million kids over at our house, you know? Right. And your but, dad, and, and your dad, was he always working somewhere? And, and uh, what, what, what was that like? Did your dad, what did your dad, what did your dad do for a living? So my dad was an entrepreneur. He came over from this country when he was a teenager. He came on a student visa to go to college and Somewhere. he, he came from Syria. Okay. So he started his own painting business when he was 20 something. And then when he got, you know, he set up a goal to not be doing painting by the time he was a certain age, because, you know, it's, it's a lot of hard work and he would do exteriors and interiors and he did everything and he's very athletic. So um, then he did contracting, he did fire adjusting, he did um, real estate, um, brokering and so whatever he could he got his license in just about everything you know back then it was, it was um you know you you had a lot of different opportunities now everything's kind of regulated to that but um so he worked six days a week he would leave the house around um 6 a.m come home around 6 p.m he worked for himself he worked in his own office and um he worked those hours six days a week and then he would come home, get showered, spend some time with the family, have dinner, go to bed. You know, he was an early to bed, early to right. rise kind of person. Right. And then on Sundays, it was family day. So Sunday, he would come home from work on Saturday and then same thing, go grocery shopping, whatever, you know, do what you had to do. Mm -hmm. And on Sundays, we'd all pile in the car and go somewhere. We so never let me ask you. What, what were some of the things that you learned early in life? What, what were some of the lessons that your mother taught you, that your father taught you that still stick with you today? So they taught me a belief that um, there, was, there was never anything you couldn't accomplish if you put your mind to it and you put some effort into it. Right. Okay. No, I, don't, I don't believe in that now. <laughs> Does that sound bad to say as a motivational person? <laughs> I think that we have biological impediment, impediments. And okay. the, um, we might not be able to do everything we want to do. Talk about that. What do you mean by that? Well, I think that um, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that people will never be able to do. And when you tell it somebody you could do this no matter what, then mm -hmm. that makes it a failure on the person's part if they haven't figured out a way to get it done. But say, mm -hmm. for instance, you were born with one leg. You would not be walking per se upright unless you had an assist. You could have a prosthetic leg or, you know, you could have somebody give you crutches or you could have somebody hold you up and walk. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but you biologically won't walk without an assist. So that's not a bad thing. That doesn't mean that you won't get where you want to go. Maybe you'll crawl, maybe somebody will help you. I think that the thing that you have to realize is that when you set a goal and you want to meet it, it really is about how you maneuver with your goal. It's right. more about how you take care of yourself to meet your goal than it is about saying just like, well, just muscle through this and you'll get through it. Right. There's and something you might not ever be able to do, but you can do them. You could do other things that might get you to the same place. Right. And and so and so what I also hear you saying is that it's important to to have a level of you know realism in your perspective. So, you know, the the I the ideal sort of proverbial lessons that anybody might give you is a, is a great thing, but you also want to be realistic with yourself about your, your expectations, because number one, we, we, we're not, we're not all perfect and we, we're not all meant to be everywhere at all times. And so we got to look at that as well. So I actually think differently. Mm -hmm. I think that it's not, I think that what you have to do with yourself more is learn to forgive yourself when things don't turn out the way you want i think you should have wild imaginations i think you should try to make every dream come true i think that whatever you imagine you should go full force on it if it's something you want to do but if you fall short of that don't beat yourself up go look ah this is how far i got amazing or wow you know what i've been doing it this way for so long and i got this far but let me try to do it some other way because I really want to reach this goal. It's right. a matter of taking stock in, you have a fantasy, your hopes and dreams are these really fantastic ideas. And then how do you get them? And then also how do you, um, if you don't get them, how do you treat yourself if you didn't get there? Right, right. And I think that that's and really huge. And the fact that what we call the time, I think, yeah, I think so too. That's the one thing nobody ever talks about when they're talking about setting goals and meeting um, life goals. Like, listen, you know, um, there's always going to be a way to do something, but it might not be exactly what you thought it was. And you might have to abandon the plan halfway through, regroup, you know, like life's a journey. You know that already. It's more about the journey than it is about the destination. So I think that the one thing that nobody ever talks about when they talk about motivation is the what do you have to forgive yourself when you had to make compromises on the way or when you didn't it didn't turn out exactly as you wanted it? Mm -hmm. Is it is that still a valid outcome? And I think it is. Without a doubt. I don't I don't know if we do enough self forgiveness in our society. And so I think I think that that's a major that's a major point that you just made is that we need to remember to to forgive ourselves. It doesn't mean that you're uh, any more or any less. But did you do that? Did you cover that benchmark with yourself? Are you treating yourself properly? So I only so I only started doing that when it came time to taking care of my mother. When mm. I took when I took care care of my mom, I had her home with me for five years. Wow. And because she really wanted to stay home, I gave up my home to live with her. And she really wanted to live in her house. We renovated the house so that she could live in there. But her needs became much more less about mobility and more about um, the kind of um, her needs wound up being more than I could provide. In okay. other words, like her needs were that she wants to stay in her house, but that didn't encompass what about me? You know, like how much could I do every single thing for her because mm -hmm. she couldn't do it on her own anymore. And the future of how progressive the disease is and where's that gonna take her and her needs and I was already burning out. So I had to, somebody spent an awful lot of time talking to me regularly about placing her in a th assisted living and what the benefits were and what the benefits were going to be to me. Right. And that sounded dirty and horrible, right? Like, and yeah. selfish. How could I be talking about me when somebody has a terminal disease and their only wish is to 
do this one particular thing, which is just sit in their house. Mm -hmm. And it became when I knew I couldn't do it anymore and that I couldn't provide for her for my own mental health issues, as well as for the fact that she really wasn't getting a comprehensive life where she was here. Right. In order to place her into a home, I had to forgive myself. And right. that was the first time when I really came, thought about that com conflict and everything that I do now, I do it, which is why I bring it up so early in this interview is you got to forgive yourself. Your hopes and your dreams may not come off the way you want them to, mm -hmm. but how do you reconcile that with how life really is? You know, when we talk about being motivated to get something done, we think of it in a very linear way. We think of somebody who has an idea, expounds on that idea, gets charged up by it emotionally, really thinks that it'll make a difference, and then runs towards that goal, which is great if, if that happens. But most of us do this, right? <laughs> like, you know, life comes up, maybe they have a goal and then they had a child. Maybe they had a goal and then they went broke. Maybe they had a goal got so much money, got distracted from their goal. Like, you don't know. Right. You don't know. So I think one of the things about that we don't really talk about in terms of motivationing is the fact that these goals typically don't happen in a straight line and they typically take years to, to fruition. So life is still happening. So you got to kind of give yourself a break and say, look, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it in the time it takes to do it, not the time I think it should take to do it. Right. And maybe so in the way I want to do it, but in the way that it actually happens. Right. And and you see, that's that's another that's another great tenant in this conversation that for one, adults all across America can benefit from revisiting this morning is that you know what you where you're going in life, you can see a straight path to it, but you've got to know that there, there's going to be a dozen ups and downs on the way to achieving your actual goal. And um, for a lot of people, I, I actually talked to an adult at a career fair who felt like, you know, he, he gave up at the first sign of adversity and he never recovered from that, you know? And I think that that's so important to understand that when you have those kinds of adversity, this is, this is a true story I'm going to tell you now, Cedric. And this was prior to me understanding about how life really works. When I was younger, I was in school and I'm the fourth out of five children. Okay. And every, so my brother who's younger than me is a mathematical whiz. He can do anything about math in his head. Like is, he's amazing. And, but that's his main skill. Like he really is good with that. Mm -hmm. And it showed from day one, like in second grade, he was getting every math award there was. So he was always much more advanced than I am in those kind of analytics. And then I had three brothers and sisters above me. So in essence, even though I was the fourth, intellectually, I was probably the fifth or sixth, right? Mm -hmm. So I never grew up thinking that I was particularly bright because there was a lot of shining stars, people who read better than me people who analyze math better than me. But the truth is I wasn't far behind. I wasn't, not only was I not far behind, I wasn't behind in really anything. When you take it outside the broad spectrum, like this is just the truth. When we graduated high school, I don't know if you had it in Ohio, but when you graduate here in New York City, there's like a ranking in your school. So there's, in my class, there was 900 and... I don't know what, 997 or something, just under a thousand students. Right. And I was ranked 98 out yeah. of thousand students. So that's, that's the top 10%, right? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> you would think, right? But now when you look at it, my brother, the math guy was ranked third out of a thousand something students, like, right? you know, a thousand students, right? Mm -hmm. My sister was ranked, um, I don't know, sixth or something. Mm -hmm. The next ranking was my other brother who ranked the, the next worst ranking was he was in the 30s. He was like 36. So if you look at it, right, like where everybody's looking at a ranking mm -hmm. and you look at 36 to 98, you think you're doing bad. 
Right. Even now, you're not, right? But right. that's perspective. When you have a narrow perspective, you don't really understand. So when I would go to to go to college, say, I would go to college thinking I was like way behind everybody. And then the colleges would want to sign me up. Right. I wasn't really way behind everybody. I was way behind my family. Right. But not such an and not in a devastating way. But because there's no perspective when you're younger and you don't really understand all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So so anyway, so here's the point of the story. So here I am, right, thinking that I'm not doing well academically because I'm not reading, I'm not, you know, doing things. But I was learning disabled, which nobody knew about in the 60s and 70s. Nobody ever knew anything about that. So they were just starting to learn about it in the like 70s and 80s. Mm-hmm. So always in my family, no matter what, the conversation was always, you were going to go to college, you were going to finish college. Mm-hmm. There was no room for anything else. So, of course, I went to college. I went to the college of my parents' choice. And just like all my brothers and sisters did, and I dropped out the first year. Why? I dropped out like the first semester. <laughs> and then it was the big family joke because like I would drop out of school more than I would be in school, but I couldn't do it, you know? Yeah. But I wanted to do it. So I would go to a different school. I would drop out of that school, go to a different school, drop out of that school. So it turns out that in in college, Overall, I don't remember how many times I dropped out, but it was between four and six. I think it, definitely four, probably six. Right. But it was so many years that it took me 19 years to graduate with my undergraduate degree, dropping out for years and years and uh, years in, in between. Wow. But when I got and I had to seek out the answers myself, right? I had to go and get tested. I got um, some bad testing advice, then I got some really good testing advice. Then so, I did that. So let's 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 slow it down a little bit because what you're describing right now, I think, applies to a lot of people in, yeah. our, in our society. And the first thing that I want to revisit is how you you weren't you weren't the least of your class by any means at all no. but, still, but you still had to deal with the analytics you have to deal with the numbers the the, the rankings the attempts to to quantify where you really were but yeah. i don't think i don't think that anybody's uh quantification of your actual talents was accurate what now, you- now it was crazy because because when i would come into school i would walk into school as being the fourth and they would look at me and go Now, my brother, who was right above me, like in age, was like the class clown. And my two sisters who were above me were extremely studious students, very quiet, did all their work, all their homework. You know, my brother was a bit of a cut up. He did whatever made people laugh, which Mm -hmm. might not have been his homework. But um, so when um, when I came into school, they would just look at me and go, oh, you're a tire. And um, which one, which kind are you? (laughs) Look at me like, are you going to be a mess up or are you going to do the work? So they had high expectations for me. And when I wasn't like the other ones, they really couldn't understand it. Like they didn't have anything in there. So they would like give me a real hard time about certain things. They'd be like, well, your sister could do this or your brother could do that. How come you can't do that? Mm. And even when I went into high school, which was really funny, I took Spanish and I loved it. I wanted to speak Spanish. And my brother, because he was more advanced than I was, was in my very same Spanish class. He got like kind of skipped ahead. He couldn't really speak Spanish at all, but he could take tests really well. So I was speaking Spanish to people but I was testing lower than him. So he would get like a 98 and I'd get like an 87. And the teachers would be like, why can't you be like your brother? And I would say, but he doesn't even speak Spanish. He just tests right. well. You're, to- right. you're having this conversation with me in Spanish. Right. You couldn't do that with him. Right. <laughs> right? So it was a real hard um, thing because the judgments and the, um, you know, the, um, comparisons obviously don't help anybody. Everybody's an individual. Right. And, you know, I wonder, you know, I wonder 
from just a realistic point of view, how many people are out there right now being compared to their brothers and sisters or being compared to whoever came before them, maybe been in their family and, and did a, a great job, or maybe they did a horrible job. And what would you say to somebody who's going through that right now? So I would say, and I would say to hang in there because there are other parts of your life where individuality matters. Mm. And it might not be high school and it might not be with that teacher, it might not be grade school, but it doesn't matter because when somebody unlocks your individuality, either you do it yourself or somebody recognizes you, it feels great and it will happen. Wow. It's, and it doesn't, you are an amalgamation. You're not who anybody says you are. You know, you're who you are, right? Mm -hmm. But people who are young don't know who they are yet. Right. They just don't because they don't have that. So you have to recognize that there's going to be a time where somebody does recognize you because you are out of it. You know, like you're out of the milieu where you were always compared. So like when I, I was doing um, lab, lab work with this particular professor one time and I came and I was an undergraduate and I came home, my, my phone was ringing and I went and picked up the phone. That's how old I am. I, we had to pick up a phone. And, um, with a hold on, hold on, hold on. Was it, was it one of the rotaries where you got to do like this? No, nah, no, nah, that was my childhood. No, it was a regular phone. With, oh, with okay, a, I got it. You just phone. hit the buttons. The buttons would actually go up and down. That's different, too. <laughs> yeah, we're in the 90s now. Call the phone. Uh, okay. So it was my professor who had never called me at home, but he was looking at the data that I presented in class, and he just looked at me and he said, so he didn't even say, hi, Loretta, this is professor, whatever. I pick up the phone, and I'm like, hello, and he's like, you're a scientist. Did you know you were a scientist? And I said, no. He goes, how has nobody ever told you that you're a scientist? I wow. think nobody's ever told me I was a scientist. He goes, you've never had a teacher that told you you were a scientist? And I said, no, never. He goes, I don't know how that's possible. And it's possible because it's just the way life is, right? You don't always get, but there's going to be somebody one day who unlocks something in you in school terms, you know, we're just talking about like school right now, mm -hmm. but I guess in real life too, you know, when you go for a job and stuff like that, I started evaluating myself based on evaluations I got. So when people said reliable, dependable, things outside the box, I took that and wrote it on my resume because like I didn't know who I was, but other people knew who I was. It's right. like how your, your young daughters might not know who they are, but you know who they are. Right. But, you know, what, what I also really want to point out at this part of the conversation is that you had you actually were a pretty talented individual. And, and like you said, that had to be unlocked by different experiences. But it, it wasn't number one. It really couldn't be it, you really couldn't put a number on it. You really couldn't put a ranking on it because for somebody to call you and say, did you know you were a scientist? You know, when I hear that, I hold that in high regard. That doesn't sound like somebody who's in fourth or fifth place out of six. You know, that sounds like somebody who has a top tier talent inside of them. And and there there is no less than a million people in America right now who uh, they're listening to everybody around them. They might have a legacy of older brothers or, or relatives and people saying, oh, where are you in the chain of achievement? And, and, and that doesn't mean that there's not something great in them that's waiting to be unveiled. And that's what you're representing today. Ladies yes, and gentlemen. You know, it's very difficult in the United States because we rank everything yeah. and all of our grades are percentile ranked, which means where do you, where do you stand amongst your peers? Mm -hmm. Every single thing we test because of that. Mm -hmm. And you know, we kind of pigeonhole people into these very specific ways of learning about them, which may or may not be the total picture and probably is not the total picture. So right. you have to recognize that, especially in school, especially in school, that's a big old um, bomb for kids, right? Because if kids are constantly the good kids or constantly the cut up kids or constantly the lazy kids or whatever they mm -hmm. want to, you know, because people used to call me lazy all the time. Mm -hmm. You could never describe me as lazy if you ever saw me. I do more than anybody who has to do. If you give me something to do, I'm going to do it better than you thought. 
you were gonna get it. Right. You know, like you can't call me like nobody could call me lazy. I right. get up and I do everything I have to do better. But what my teachers would call me was lazy all the time because they didn't understand. And then when I couldn't read as well as others, you know, then it would just be that I was being lazy and I, obviously I could read, you know, the nuances that we understand now and that we look for in people aren't, weren't there back then. You know, okay. nobody talked about, well, you know, you don't read so well, but look at how great your comprehension is or whatever, right. you know, exactly. you don't exactly. like that. And you know that we're, that that is another big concept that we're going to get into, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking to Loretta Tayar, who is a variety of culture and a variety of experiences that she's sharing with us today. It's very important to take time out to talk to people in our community who have as many experiences as she has, and, and who's willing to provide some wisdom to us. And so we have a lot more to get to, and we'll be right back after this brief message. All right, and we're back. So, so Loretta, um, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you a little bit right now about what it was like growing up with people really having a lack of understanding. You know, you talk about there might there might have been learning issues that you were dealing with or um, symptoms that you were displaying that were not being diagnosed because people were just thinking everything is everything. And when you say something like that, it reminds me. It reminds me of stories that I've heard in the past about somebody just always being labeled a bad kid. Oh, that's a bad yeah. kid. That's a bad kid. That's a bad kid. But then when they then when they get older and they deal with more um, experienced uh, professionals, they come to find out, oh, this person has an attention disorder, or this person has you know a, a, a different a different type of uh, uh, a learning disorder that we now understand and that we now know how to treat. But you know some of these people are grown. Some of these people. You know, or they're now 30, 40, and 50 years old, but for their whole life, they were labeled, let's say, a bad person. They were labeled bad when all they really had was a, an attention disorder. Or, you know, they'll say, uh, this person has problems, but in reality, they might be suffering from post-traumatic stress. And so, yeah. you know, how, did, how, how do you feel in retrospect knowing that there was a lack of understanding when it came to being able to see the real Loretta? So I don't have any um, bad um, feeling about it only because, you know, it was the time, you know, nobody understood it. Nobody talked about it. Nobody understood. And then, and culturally in the time people had larger families, you know, my mother and father both came out of um, eight and nine children, you know, and the parents did what the parents did. They lined everybody up. Everyone got the same clothes, you know, like, they like, you know, it was a very um, different time what bothers me now is that we now understand that everybody in life is trying to progress and make their dreams come true so if somebody's not progressing name calling attributing negative things to them is is to me much more egregious as an adult to do to mm -hmm. any human being much less a child because we now understand that people there's much more room for individuality than there was when i was coming up you know so and why do you think that that people, what why, why do you think that is there's more room for individuality now than there was back then we understand it better we understand that it's a possibility we understand that you know there have been huge trailblazers in things like um in all all different um ways of being so now we understand that pe we we might not 
know how or why it happens, but we intuitively understand that it does happen, that there are things that hold people back and there are things that make people different. You know, we tried to mask all that stuff for years as a society, right? We didn't let people um, express their um, their love affection for other same-sex people or for not having a, a, a you know, any kind of preference or we understand now that there's all different things and we understand that every culture is a little different. So I think that because we have that understanding now, when adults and people in authority like, like teachers go back to the old um, nonsense ways of just saying, oh, well, you're just lazy or you're just this and that, and it's negative instead of trying to figure out what is it about this child that's making them not progress? Or what is it about this human that's making them not progress? Because in my opinion, humans always want to progress. When you look at any baby, they don't just sit down on a, on a chair and sit there until they're 21. No, they want to learn things. They want to do things. They want to see things. So when you see somebody who's not progressing, what does that mean? And then you also have to look at progress, right? If it's progress for you, is it necessarily progress for me you know like yeah, yeah. you know like just yeah, you want me to get 100 should i get 100 if i don't want to you know who knows yeah i think i think that if, if you're progressing i think that that affects me and so your progress is also my progress yeah if you embrace it right i mean if you don't you know the the, the whole thing about this whole conversation is that i want to to really get across is that Things happen in the time that they're supposed to happen. And unfortunately, we put pressures on ourselves. So for instance, this is the truth. I graduated college in 19 years. I was 30 or I was 36 years old by the time I graduated college. I was working full time. I had a career, but all I ever wanted was education. And I didn't care about the piece of paper as much. I really just wanted to know things. Mm -hmm. And um, and I wanted to be enlightened in that way. So college was very, very important to me. Now, was I considered you know, a flunky in my family for not uh, getting through college in the four years it took or less that it took everybody else in my family? Yeah, but guess what? I have a degree, I love the knowledge I have, but now when it came time, once I got really good at school, I did my master's degree in four years, not because I was working full time and going to school part time, I could have done it in the prescribed two years mm -hmm. if I was rich and didn't have to work. So once I got the hang of school and once I understood what it would take to get through school, I could do it no problem. Right. But if I if you had told me that I could only get if I can only go in this one direction and never finish and I had to finish, you know, uh, college within a certain time frame or limitations or whatever, I mean, then I would have never been on that journey and I would have never had the ideas that I had and the information that I gained. So let me get this straight. You you your adversities when it came to education, they didn't start for you when you got to college. This is something that you dealt with for the whole entire uh, elementary school years, junior high school and high school. And it pretty much really didn't go understood. But then when you got to college, you didn't let any of that stop you. And you, I did let it stop me. I dropped out many times. Right. But what I'm saying is that you continued to apply yourself. And you continue. Well, I always had a dream and I continued to try to find a way to make my dream happen. That's what I'm talking about. You got to mm -hmm. forgive yourself if it doesn't go the way you think it's going to go. Mm -hmm. You got to forgive yourself if you give up and you take a break and you go back at it in a different way. You know, you got to just be OK. Like my friend, my friend used to always um, ask me, like, how do you how do you do it like you're like the oldest kid in school like doesn't that bother you mm -hmm. and i would say yeah but i'm not gonna stop doing what i want to do i want to get a degree i want to learn this stuff right i don't know things so it's it's a noise it's a static now i have attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity i also have comorbid um other disabilities like dysgraphia dyslexia i have a lot a bunch of stuff going on 
and it becomes extremely difficult for me to like sit through a test and get all that done so i had to like really study in a different way because sitting in classrooms next to somebody who say was tapping a pen while taking an exam mm -hmm. i had to overcome that in me because i can't just turn around and tell 12 kids to stop tapping their pencils right because that's what they do during a test you know, and nobody's going to give me a special room to sit in. I did that, you know, as a disabled person, I could have gotten that, but it didn't get me any um, good results. So I stopped that. But you have to kind of just, I've had to take less, um, I've had to take a lesser grade on an exam because I've been distracted by people. But, you know, okay, so I got an 87 instead of a 92 or whatever. But, you know, you got to just, you just got to do what you got to do. And then you got to, like I said, you got to like learn to go, okay, the, in that situation, it was the best I could have done. So I did it. How did you, how did you change your study habits to succeed? Oh, I took, I took full responsibility. And then what I did was this. So when I first got, when I got a good diagnosis of all the things that I would do, they gave me a list. I got a bad diagnosis that said, drop out. You'll never, you know, you're disabled, but we'll never figure it out. And you're too old. And that was at 26. And then I got a better diagnosis, um, probably late 20s, early 30s, that said, no, you have all these things. And this is what you need to do. And I brought it to the Office of Disabilities, and they gave me a special room to take tests in and stuff. But I found that it wasn't advantageous to me because the people in the special rooms were making noise outside the special rooms. So what I had to do was, um, what I did was this. I had to leave my, I don't know what, hubris or something aside. I went to each professor and I would ask the professor on the first day of class, and I would say, if I want to get an A in this class, how do I need to study for this class? Mm -hmm. And whatever the professor told me to do, that's what I did. So one professor told me, you have to read this textbook at least five times before any exam for you to be able to. You have to show up to every lecture. You have to have all your labs in and your notes. And so that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And I got an A, which was astounding because, you know, this wasn't my strong point. But after a while, I didn't have to ask the professors that anymore. I would just do the most I could do. So it, it took me like playful study, like 24 seven, I would sleep for maybe six hours a night. And then I would do I would study in the morning. I would get up early before work and study. And then I would do something called playful study that I did, which was like teach all the people around me like what I was learning so that right. I would be, I'd be like, oh, you can't believe what I just learned in class yesterday, blah, blah, blah. And then we'd talk about it and that would get more into it. Right. And then um, I would go home and study, you know, like, so we would joke around about it. We would do things like I would engage the rest of the rest of my coworkers who were great, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but, um, but that's what I had to do. I had to just ask, like, how do you, you know, I wouldn't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you just have to do the most you can do and not the least. Right. I think it's pretty cool that you decided to, to learn through teaching others. I think that's a really good, that's a really good tactic to put out there. Oh, we had so much fun because some of the subjects were so hard. When I was learning about learning and behavior, which is like a real heavy duty, like how do organisms learn and how do they behave? It's huge. I mean, it's like stuff you never even thought about in your life. So you have no like reference point to it. So when we would learn about all these lab animals and stuff and and we would learn about like, like for instance, like how do people overdose when they've been taking drugs all these years, why do they all sudden overdose? And we learned about that in school from a biological standpoint. So I would go into class like the next day and go like, oh, you know how rock stars overdose always in hotels? This is the reason. And then it would start like a whole thing and, and everybody was in on it. It was just like joking fun, but it was really informative and, and also helped me digest. And then we did study groups with the kids in school on lunch hours or whatever. But, you know, you just got to do the most. 
But you know, if I had limited myself in time and scope, then I would have been out because it took me so long to graduate. Right. Well, it's it's funny you 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 just said that because yesterday we were literally talking about drugs and drug abuse. And wow. so when you say that you 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 learned about why people overdose all of a sudden, you know, I want to connect the dots between what we're talking about today in this juncture and what we talked about yesterday. So how is it that people, a rock star might overdose all of a sudden? So it has to do with um, the fact that they're not used to the surroundings in which they're taking the same level of narcotics. So, mm. so because we do something called habituate, we get, we get used to an environment. So all the stimuli in that environment um, become like non-noticed. So when you're in an environment that you're constantly in, say for instance, uh, um, somebody shoots up in their living room every day, they will to get the same amount of high because their stimulation is all the same, will have to increase the amount of drugs they get into their system because they're used to everything around them. So they need more to make it salient for them. They need more to make it noticeable. Wow. However, if they go to a new environment, if you notice a lot of people overdose in new environments, all that stimulation is new. So there, everything is becomes heightened. And when they put in the excess amount of drugs, say they're doing an intravenous thing, they overdose because they haven't habituated to that surrounding yet. So they could have used less narcotics and been safer. But you know, the more narcotics you use, the less likely you are to be safe. So they, so that's the reason why, I mean, I, that's the reason why yeah. in, many, in many instances. That, I just learned something new today. Thank you for teaching me that. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So imagine me doing that like in in, uh, in in work going, hey guys, guess what I just learned? <laughs> right, right, right. And, and, and over the course of 19 years, I'm just, I'm so inspired by that. I'm so inspired by that. I'm still, I am still in my, in my journey through college. And oh. I know a lot of other people who are still in their journey through college. You still in and, it, it happens. That's yeah. the cool thing about college. I was at some point just taking one class a semester because that's all I could do. Right. But nobody gave me a hard time about doing that. Like no, like you know, maybe I would have been laughed at by other people, like in my family or whatnot. I'm, I, I doubt it. I doubt it. But in school, they don't care if you show up for one class and do it for ten years. They don't care as long as you pay your bill. Right. Like this. So the the whole purpose of this topic was what do you, you know, you have your hopes and your dreams and you want to achieve those goals, but it's not necessarily linear, linear and you don't necessarily do it in the way that you think you're going to do it, mm -hmm. but just keep doing it. Don't disrespect yourself in a way by giving up because it's not going the same way everybody else's journey went. Your journey is your own journey. It's going to go the way it's going to go. Who knows? We keep thinking that everything has to be planned and then executed and then because we watch a lot of tv it has to be executed perfectly if you right. ever watch like you know top chef or anything like that you know they get they get thrown out for like one extra um cucumber seed on their plate mm -hmm. you know that's you know that could right. happen chances are it won't don't worry about all that stuff right got to be able yeah. to go with the flow yeah and then that's right and the flow might be like in your case Maybe the flow is that you have uh, children and then you get sidetracked and then later on you go back to it. Or maybe you have enough money to go to, to do your um, tuition, but then you get this awesome opportunity to do something else and you take that money and you do that. Doesn't mean that you don't go and do your other dream. Like you can have dreams. We all can have many different dreams at one time. Yep. And yep. we can juggle that or not, you know, like it's all, none of it's that big of a deal. Whatever you think your life path is going to be, yeah, who knows? But don't, don't worry if it doesn't go the way you thought it was going to go. Enjoy wherever the hell you are. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now, 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 so, so we're out of college. You did a great job with that. Kudos to you. Did you also become a mother along the way? I did. And I finished my graduate degree. 
I wanted to go on and become um, a doctor of psychology. I was going to get my um, doctorate in psychology. And um, I had decided that, you know, I had always wanted to be a mother. Always, always, always. Mm. And I didn't mind being married, but I didn't want to be married to the wrong person. So I didn't wind up finding somebody that I want to marry. So I decided that it was my time. I graduated when I was 40 from graduate school. Congratulations. So I decided that it was my time to parent. And I figured being a psychologist, I could, you know, that's one of the professions where you could be old and be a psychologist. People just think that you're wiser. You know, if I wanted to be a basketball player, I wouldn't be able to do that. Old, but you know, so um, so I decided I was going to um, raise my family and then I could go back and get my doctorate at any time. So that's what I did. And um, I adopted teens out of foster care, out of New York City foster care. And um, I've been a parent now for 13 years. And it's been great. Yeah. So that's how I didn't. So I didn't wind up. Um, my goal was always to get a master's degree. I don't know why I always thought that that was like the coolest thing ever. So I love that I got it. I did not like getting it. <laughs> going to school for your <laughs> master's degree is a lot worse than going for your bachelor's degree. But I'm so happy I have it. I love it. I'm glad I did it. But I'm I'm so glad I'm a parent. I might not get to do my doctorate just because it's not my dream anymore. Mm-hmm. But um, it's it's been a great journey being a parent. And I've got to use my education for my kids, too. And the fact that I, I used to teach my kids all the time because my kids, some of them didn't have to finish high school. Some of the ones that came to me, you know, couldn't read well or couldn't do certain things well. You know, uh, you know how trauma and a lot of stuff affects the brain so and I got them you know like they all were able to decompress to a certain degree and really you know blossom in beautiful ways but the one thing I taught them was that college is a great goal and you could do it whenever you want I'll tell my story took me 19 years and that it's not there's nothing wrong you know your journey is your journey you get to it so you're you're a hero you're a hero today not and, 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 and and no, absolutely, without a doubt, because not only did you push through, achieve what you wanted to achieve, you didn't just stop at a bachelor's degree, you got a master's degree, and that portion of your life, it's not all about college. And like you said, sometimes the, the end goal is, is, is the lesson. It's not the journey itself, it's the lesson that you get out of it. And so that lesson that you present today about pushing through is a testimony that can benefit us all. And, and so you went above and beyond in that endeavor, but then you did even more. You decided to become a parent uh, to not just one child, but multiple children, and the, and they were teenagers. And so, and then you, you met them where they were and you helped them to decompress and you helped them to grow into, into stable adults. And I think that that is absolutely phenomenal. How did it feel, how did it feel for you watching your children leave the nest? Oh, so watching them leave the nest was hard. I remember when my youngest came to me and she was getting her first apartment and she said, okay, I'm going to get my first apartment. And it was, I was so sad. I'll be at work, like with little tears in my eyes, like my baby's leaving. And then, um, you know, once the, the house was quiet and clean, and it was like, wow, this is great. <laughs> because the one thing my baby told me when she was leaving, because she left me when she was like 22, I think. And she told me on the, the day she was moving out, she said, okay, um, I just want you to know, you know, I'm moving out. We're, you know, but don't think I'm going to call every day and don't think we're going to see each other all the time. You know, I need my independence and and I said, I said, um, we will call every day and or every other day, and uh, you know, I'm sure we'll see each other. You know, don't worry about it. Right. So from that, we of course we call every day. Now it's been I don't know eight years or something. And she goes, she says to me one day, I get a text at like one in the morning. It's been 26 hours. Where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> and she was the one saying, like, we're not going to call every day. So it's been an absolute joy. It's been a joy. 
Okay. So we got we've got um we've got about a, a minute and a half left, and mm -hmm. I have three questions that I need you to answer in that minute and a half. Okay. Um, the first one is, what is survival to you? Um, I think it's just being able to live your life. I think a lot of people, uh, you know, you just got to survive enough to live your life. Mm -hmm. And what is success to you? I think success is being, being um, able to meet your own goals. Mm. Okay. And what is greatness to you? Um, I think greatness is when you, I think you're great when you can share, when you get to the point in your life where you can share and give back and do um, things for others. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. See, here in my different type of world, I believe that there are three phases in life. And we have an objective to get to the third phase, which is greatness. A lot of people are stuck in the survival phase. There are a lot of people who are in the success phase, and that goes on for on and on and on and on. But it's also important if you talk to people who are consider themselves any level of success to get to the next level for them too. And that's greatness. And so you did a very, a very great job answering those questions. And in summation of the things you share with us today, I just want to let you know that um, you, your story is very uh, inspirational for people to, to hear and to understand. The work that you've done has helped the community. It's helped your family. It's helped me. It's helped my family. It's helped my perspective. And, uh, and I want to honor that today. I want to give you a respect and praise while you're still living, let you know that, that what you're doing is awesome. And uh, your story will exist on the America's Next Motivator platform inside of a Pride Empowerment Network annals forever. And uh, you, Loretta, not only receive your crown today, but you are one of America's Next Motivators. Uh, thank you, Cedric. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate such kind things coming from such a great person. Thank you. Without a doubt. Thanks for joining us today. I'll talk to you later, okay? Okay, great. Bye-bye. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been another installment of America's Next Motivator. I'd like for you to tune in tomorrow as we talk with a, a teacher, a teacher in the public school system who's dealt with a variety of experiences. And he's going to talk to you about what his experience was like in the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. His name is Mr. Harvey, and uh, we're going to be talking to him tomorrow. Thanks. Bye-bye.